to pray, confirming the infamy of the day. While Maxims too is clear that, quote, the criminal should hang, should properly repay the evil he previously did. Other punishments appear as well. Juliana, refusing marriage and the worship of pagan gods, is hung from a beam by her hair, beaten for six hours, and placed in prison. Fates of the Apostles recounts two executions of martyrs uh, with swords, three with unspecified weapons, and one by beating. Punishment was familiar enough to act as a description for emotional experience, as when in Baal, the death of one son at the hands of another, which precluded vengeance as well as restitution, is compared to the impotence of a father watching his son hanged on the gallows. Quote, his son hanged is a comfort to the raven, and he did not have the power to help him. Thus, while punishment and supportive social order was familiar, it also carried a profoundly personal resonance and could convey a sense of alienation. Moreover, representations of Anglo-Saxon punishment continued to be evoked after the Norman conquest of 1066. As the laws penned by Wolfstan, as Nicole's been discussing, continued to influence uh, Norman legislation, so the Anglo-Saxon past, which was a rich source for, for historians, Norman and English alike, uh, to draw on in support of claims to rights and privileges in England. The Norman historians, of course, dwelt on Harold Godwinson's usurpation of the throne, that Edward the Confessor promised to William and represented Harold's death, death as a perfectly just punishment, as the bio-tapestry would have it, hic Harold rex interfectus est, uh, here King Harold is killed. The English historians made other kinds of claims, but focused on the criminal English who had brought the nation to a state that it could be conquered, first by the Danes, then by the Normans. Thus, those punishments administered to Englishmen before and after the conquest were made to carry meaning. The most popular villain from, among, uh, from before the conquest, one placed at the center of historical narratives, was Adric, Elderman of Mercia. Depicted as a traitor and a villain during Canute's conquest of England in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, Adric inspired those who recorded his role in history to enumerate his many crimes, if not attribute new ones to him, and they did just make things up. Uh, and to provide great detail to the scene of his execution. In the 11th and 12th century accounts, Adric is variously, and I love this sentence, Adric is variously killed, killed and thrown over the walls of London, strangled in private and dumped from a window into the Thames, beheaded, publicly beheaded and dumped into the Thames, beheaded with his head displayed on the highest tower in London, and beheaded with his head displayed on the highest gate in London. With each account, it would seem to the histori that the historian selects Adric's story to build into the structure of his larger narrative of the conquests of England, first by Knut, then by the Normans. In fact, the Anglo-Norman historian's treatment of Adric's execution should catch our attention, because as has been noted, between 1076 and 1312, not a single English earl, and indeed hardly a single baron, was executed or murdered in England for political reasons. Through the forms of betrayal, discovery, judgment, and execution are made to take, the historian provides a moral commentary and offers an ideological guide for the audience's interpretation. Here I only have space to discuss a pair of texts in brief, uh, but I believe that they effectively demonstrate the value of tracing the shifts and details across historiographical narratives. Um, so in the Deeds of the Kings of the English People by William of Malmesbury, the Gesta Regum Anglorum, uh, William elaborates Adric's story and gives him a much greater role than had any previous account. He also adds information that is not present in any previous accounts and makes clear the consequences of Adric's actions. For example, a claim appearing nowhere else is that during the St. Bryce's Day Massacre of 1002, that was when uh, King Ethelred declared that all Danes living among the English would be killed on the same day. Uh, Adric murdered Gunhild, the Danish king Swain's sister, thereby giving Swain cause to conquer England. William also first recounted aspects that were retained by later historians. Most important of these is the claim that Adric had the English king Edmund Ironside murdered. William says, and I quote, Rumor implicates Adric as having, in support of Canute, contrived Edmund's death by means of servants. There were, it was said, two of the king's chamberlains to whom he had entrusted his entire life. Adric won them over with promises, and though at first they were horrified at such a monstrous crime, he soon made them his accomplices, and as he had planned, when the king took his seat for the requirements of nature, they drove an iron hook into his hinder parts. This form of murder squares nicely with William's judgment of Adric's character as fex hominum, uh, literally the shit of humanity. Uh, the gruesome crime goes well beyond switching sides during a battle. 
He not only betrays a king, but perverts that king's most faithful servants. And of course, he's a regicide. Um, he's a threat to king and nation alike. Clearly, Williams Canute understands this. Quote, in the same year, Adric, to whose infamy I cannot do justice, was by the king's command entrapped in his turn by the same trick that he had frequently used in the past to entrap many others, and his disgusting spirit was transferred to hell. High words had arisen as a result of some dispute or other, and Adric, emboldened by the services he had rendered, reminded the king as though in a friendly fashion of his deserts. And he said, first I abandoned Edmund for you, and then also put him to death out of loyalty to you. At these words, Canute's expression changed. His face flushed with anger, and he delivered sentence forthwith. Then you too, he said, will deserve to die if you were guilty of high treason against God and myself by killing your own lord and a brother who is in alliance with me. Thy blood be upon thy head, for thy mouth hath testified against thee, saying that thou hast lifted up thy hand against the Lord's anointed. And then, to avoid a public disturbance, the traitor was strangled in the same chamber and thrown out the window into the Thames, thus paying the due penalty for his perfidy. However much Canute sounds like a character out of Pulp Fiction, uh, he is a wise, or at least clever, king who can entrap a traitor. But however just his judgment of Adric, this is a political murder rather than an execution. While Adric is a damning portrayal of a disloyal English aristocrat, Williams Canute is an ambiguous royal figure with questionable motives. There is drama here uh, that is more meaningful than the history of the events. Henry of Huntingdon uh, follows William of Malmesbury in much of his account of Adric and Canute. He gives us the fullest account of all, including the representation of Canute as a just king. What is essential for justice to take place is that everything must be in the open. As in William of Malmesbury's account, Adric is made responsible for Edmund's death immediately after Edmund and Canute reach an agreement to partition England. However, instead of seducing his servants away from him, Henry has Adric send his own son. Quote, a few days after this, King Edmund was treacherously killed at Oxford. This is how he was killed. When the king, fearful and most formidable to his enemies, was prospering in his kingdom, he went one night into the lavatory to answer a call of nature. There, the son of Alderman Adric, who by his father's plan was concealed in the pit of the privy, struck the king twice with a sharp knife in the private parts, and leaving the weapon in his bowels, fled away. While the story of Edmund's death remains largely the same, he's killed in the privy through Adric's plot, the details are important and stand in for what is omitted from Henry's account. The murder takes place immediately after the partition in which Edmund received Wessex and Canute Mercia, the region Adric controlled. Therefore, there are suggestions of political maneuvering underlying this account. Second, the issue of heirs is established. Adric sends his son instead of seducing away Edmund's servants, as in William's version. And Edmund is stabbed in his private parts, suggesting the destruction of his line. Adric's treachery here is depicted as elevating his own family at the expense of the English, king, royal line, and community. However, Henry's imagery of the betrayal should drive our interpretation. I think taking a cue from William's description of Adric as fex hominum, uh, Henry places Adric's son beneath the king, standing in shit, stabbing upward, and you can just imagine, I'm not describing. Uh, I posit that this ought to be seen as a commentary on the aristocracy working actively to elevate themselves. While Henry follows William in recounting that Edmund is murdered according to Edric's plan, he diverges in having Edric executed and displayed, both as a representation of justice and a warning to would-be traitors. Quote, then Edric came to King Canute and saluted him, saying, Hail, sole king. When he disclosed what had happened, the king answered, As a reward for your great service. I shall make you higher than all the English nobles. Then he ordered him to be beheaded and his head to be fixed on a stake on London's highest tower. What stands out in these examples is that as the post-conquest historians looked back to the Anglo-Saxon period and attempted to explain the conquest, they not only repeated their sources, they added to and modified them. The stories took on new elements, new details, and conveyed new meanings. Well after they had happened, the crimes and the punishments of the English grew and were embellished to continue producing meaning giving warnings to kings to guard against injustice and treachery, giving spectacular warnings to would-be criminals and traitors through long-dead characters, and explaining to the English that they had been conquered because of a lack of fidelity and unity in the nation. Thus, Anglo-Saxon punishment was not only still legible after the Anglo-Saxon period. Punishment narratives were still actively written to convey meaning in the post-conquest world. Uh, so thank you, and that leaves us about 20 minutes for conversation and questions if you're so inclined.
as for descriptions of the process, I wish there were. Um, one of the, the problems with dealing with Anglo-Saxon law and legal culture is, is we have to patch so much together from very spare evidence. So we have a handful of Anglo-Saxon lawsuits, uh, maybe 100, 150 or so, uh, that outline some procedure. We have a few narrative sources, um, but for the most part, we're still working on that. So um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about my sources and, and then pass it along. Um, certainly, the Old English translation of the Consolation of Philosophy is a pretty remarkable text. It's extremely long, extremely intense. Um, but what strikes me about it is that it is done in a fairly loose manner in certain sections. So this was created as part of King Alfred's translation program to turn Latin text into Old English so everybody could read them. Um, and the looseness with which this particular chapter, chapter 38, was translated suggests to me that, that the so-called translator was adding quite a bit of his own perspective, which makes it so useful to us in sort of pulling out some information about what judges might have been doing, thinking, or feeling at this point, a difficult question. Um, as for the archeological evidence, um, in the last 15 or 20 years, there has been a great upsurge of re-identification of cemeteries as deviant cemeteries. So while at first, um, I, I believe in the early part of the 20th century, these were often identified as Roman cemeteries or something else entirely. Sometimes they're even um, identified as human sacrifice or Neolithic, stuff that doesn't hold up to scrutiny today. Um, the thinking um, is that these were very separate areas that were probably used as execution sites and then the bodies were just left there. What makes this so interesting in the later Anglo-Saxon period is that in the 10th century, we start to see a firmer requirement that Christian bodies in good standing with the church be buried in consecrated ground. Before the 10th century, it was kind of hit and miss, you didn't lose anything. But starting in the mid 10th century or so, everyone wanted to be within those cemeteries uh, attached to churchyards and blessed by a bishop. So when you have something that is so very separate and where you have burials where limbs are scattered everywhere, people's heads put between their legs, uh, decomposition setting in at different rates, sort of suggesting um, display above ground before burial, we get a very different picture of how the reality of Anglo-Saxon justice might have operated. So reading that against the laws, we get a little bit of procedure, maybe. Uh, Susanna, the, there's not much, as, as uh, Nicole says, about the process. There's less narrative than we would like. Um, but from but you, you can piece together things. Um, and I'm thinking of Beowulf uh, and heroic poetry, particularly Beowulf. There's a lot going on there about the honorableness of blood revenge, of blood feud. Um, there's also an interesting elision between money and gold or treasure. So it's very hard, the hordes, the Crondall horde, and also Sutton Who, which is a wonderful, um, you can look it up on the on the internet, but it's a, it's a wonderful uh, burial uh, discovery that was uh, made that also contains uh, uh, treasure uh, troves as well and coins so we can I mean we can trace the actual coins and where they came from but it's also this elision between just um, valuable stuff and coins um, the, there's not really a strong distinction between them um, so heroic poetry I would say is important uh, for the uh, romance in some ways of uh, of honorable blood uh, and the law codes, there's also the Anglo-Saxon chronicles as well. And I think it's interesting to note, particularly about the law codes, that they really wouldn't have got written down if it hadn't been because of the programmatic Christianizing of England, because that was a literate culture that wrote in Latin. And so things, uh, law codes and um, So it's very hard to separate the theologizing of the law from the actual records. 
Um, but I'd like to just add a couple of little things uh, that have nothing to do with paper, I guess. Um, so first, we had, there actually is a remarkable amount of discussion of process. They just don't tell us the details, right? So they say, there will be this process of ordeal, and it will be the ordeal of the hot iron or the boiling pot or uh, the hot iron. You have to carry a hot iron in your hands a certain distance. We don't know the distance. Um, and then they would bandage it and open it up again a couple days later, and if it was separating, you were guilty. If it was healing nicely, you were fine, right? God intervened. Um, you know, the boiling pot, you had to reach into a boiling pot and pull a stone out from the bottom, and then they wrapped your hand, and so on and so forth. And the worse the crime, the more severe the ordeal, the deeper the water. Um, there was the uh, ordeal of uh, bread and cheese, which is the one I would go for, um, where you had to eat bread and cheese and not choke. Um, <laughs> between boiling water and bread and cheese, bread and cheese. Um, so we see these, but they don't give the details, and in part I think that's because everybody knew them, right? They were familiar enough that they were like, no, this is the process, that's how it goes. Um, sort of speaking to some of the things that Valerie was talking about, um, we also have certain details of process such as um, how much wounds are worth and how you measure them. So if I have hit someone in the head and I've wounded their face, it's worth more than if I hit them in the head and it's hidden by the hair. So there's an element of shame. If I have hit someone in the head hard enough that I've broken their skull uh, and I can pick a bone out of it, depending on the size of that bone chunk, they get a particular payment. Um, note, this also assumes that they would live. Right? Um, and we have skulls that have clearly healed with holes in them, which means that they could do the surgery to pick out the bone splinters and keep people alive. So they're not as bad as you kind of imagine. Um, but the way to actually measure how big that was wasn't to sort of, you know, measure it by your arm or your hand, because it's little. Um, it was to put a bowl or a shield across the road and throw it into it. And if you could hear it ting, it was worth a certain amount. Right? So there's weird little process like that, but then how far you have to carry the hot iron, we don't know. Um, so, uh, there are multiple answers to this. So on the one hand, the Anglo-Saxons traded with the Welsh. Uh, they, in the past 15 years or so, we have discovered that there was far more intermarriage than we had ever thought prior to this. Um, and that the idea of sort of Englishness versus Britishness, uh, that really for several centuries we just assumed, things were a little bit more flexible. Uh, now, that being said, um, the word for the Welsh that the English used was Welch, uh, which if you've read Beowulf, you get Welchthau. She is the queen of Hrothgar, the, da uh, yeah, the Danish king. Um, Welch means Welsh, it means foreign, and it's also a word they use to mean slave. Um, in fact, Welchthau's name literally means slave slave or foreign slave. So they didn't think highly of them, um, but the evidence that we're sort of starting to develop more and more is ethnicity was not nearly as fixed as we tended to think about it, even if they didn't have a terribly high opinion of the Britons. Did I answer the question? Well, the problem there is who is in control of which territory. Uh, English law only is valid in English territory, right? And the Welsh, the Welsh had their own law co codes that are incredibly rich. Uh, oh yeah. But one of the things that we actually get in treaties, both between the English and the Danes and the English and the Welsh, uh, is a man in whichever territory will have the same werehild, right? Which means you have the same legal status. So those are treaties that they they come to, which means they really didn't want to. But for some reason or other, they came to that piece and they made that, they established that. What, 
that an Englishman and a Danishman or an Englishman and a Welshman would have the same manly wear guild in whichever territory. Um, but, but what we do see, and um, certainly in the early period when there seems to be more um, reference to the Welsh in, in early Anglo-Saxon law, and in the later period when we start to see uh, the Danes fill that same sort of foreign role in Anglo-Saxon law, um, they, they are, in the Anglo-Saxon law, it is said that they will be judged according to their own um, culture's value. So a Dane will be judged according to the Danish wear guild in Anglo-Saxon law. Um, does that make sense? The, the, the wear guild of his people will apply in Anglo-Saxon law. Um, and I, I can't speak quite so authoritatively to the Welsh, but I assume it's comparable. Can I just add a, a random uh, sidebar? Um, may, many of you may, may have come across uh, Michel Foucault's Discipline and Punish. You might have come across it in other uh, classes. And uh, it opens with a very famous uh, episode from a much later period and in France uh, of, of a regicide and the very detailed uh, uh, and excruciating um, um, death that he suffered. And it's really this period and that opening passage that Nicole started with where pain becomes, and it's again, I think, indistinguishable from a, a whole theological, a theolo theologizing of law and, and an increasingly ecclesiastically powerful culture, but pain becomes interesting, psychologically interesting and salvific, that by suffering, you, you can, uh, there's justice in suffering itself, rather than the, the things that I was looking at where there's a payment to be made and then there's closure. And so there's a lot of, there's a psychological difference uh, that, that is quite interesting and it's really starting to come together in the later part of this period. It was customary law, so it wasn't common law. So there wasn't the, these these laws were not precedent um, that have to be enforced everywhere, and so they were they were uh, prompts. But I would be very surprised if they were uniformly applied. But it, the 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 local community was the repository of customary law, and so they would be applying uh, those standards, right? Yes, but yeah, with, but with, with arresting someone, no, no, but with the with, with increasing centralization, especially uh, over the course of the late ninth century with Alfred, uh, and, and this is really moving to a single English nation moving toward. They're not prior to Alfred. Um, he declares himself to be the final judge. So you can appeal all the way up to the king, and he is the final judge. But that's only coming in in the ninth century. In the seventh century, it's very much local and customary. That's starting to shift as you get later. And yet it, it is an illusion, because the king declares the law. The law is issued in the king's name. But on a practical level, there are very few cases, in, in my understanding, that the king actually judges. Um, at very high levels, or perhaps when something has been appealed several times, then you get the king involved. For the most part, we don't know who is doing the actual judging. There are various um, sort of regional units. We have shire courts and hundred courts, these sort of local regional um, magistrates um, who are hearing what's going on. Sometimes these are local noblemen who are in charge of their area. Other times they are the king's representatives. So I, I think going back to the question about procedure that we started off with, there's a lot yet to be established about who is actually making these judgments. In some cases, we can identify particular noblemen or local officials who were involved, but sometimes there is just a blank. Hmm. So it, it, it's a good question. If you have answers, please let us know immediately. <laughs> Thanks for that. My question is, um, how different the work of the English in the Norman and 
but it, in terms of law or in terms of there were um, many efforts to, uh, on William's part to retain an apparent uh, continuity with Anglo-Saxon law, but with the Domesday survey, where basically the entire country got inventoried down to the last piglet, uh, the, there, there was a complete overhaul of, of government, uh, as well as personnel, because increasingly, People, he, he replaced uh, powerful people with, with his own men. At the same time, Old English remains in circulation for another couple hundred years. So even though I, absolutely we see a, a massive governmental over, overhaul um, by the, the 1070s, 1080s, um, the, the language does not get supplanted. So there is clearly a multicultural, multilingual experience happening in England um, across that period. So the break is certainly real, um, but might not have been perceived quite as um, tangibly as, as we can see it in hindsight, except possibly for Jones Day. Mm -hmm. And punishment shifts. Um, there are, after William has really established his foothold, um, the, the punishments start to really shift so that there's a lot less of um, judicial mutilation which is not to say that there aren't punishments. Uh, the Normans really got into blinding and castration, which are not really things the Anglo-Saxons did very much. Um, but far fewer executions. Um, so, I mean, you may call on that one, but. Win some, lose some. <laughs> Are you asking if the if the if the family of the aggrieved party were holding out for blood? Um, I I don't think that there's any one answer to that. It was very much locally decided, and depending on how powerful you were, there are stories of families that feuded bitterly and would be, would have periods of truces, and then it would all flare up again as well because of somebody, you know, because of a, of a, of a, of a, of a grievance that was decades old. Um, not unlike any kind of disturbed area where, you know, peace, peace, peace is won for a while. And actually that's one of the nice phrases of William M uh, Miller, Ian Miller's book. Uh, he would talk about the contingency of these payments. They, they were a solution for a while and a while is okay. So. <laughs> The rationale was, hmm. <laughs> I, it, it sounds entirely counterintuitive. The rationale was that if you sin, you must do penance before you die. Um, if you refuse to do penance and confess the really awful things you've done, uh, then penance needs to be imposed upon you by force. And the rationale, uh, the penitential rationale, was that if all of your limbs are chopped off, you will ask God to please save you. Um, it, it was seen as something of a foretaste of hell. You think this is bad, you wait until damnation. It's gonna be even worse. So it didn't, it, it didn't bring you closer to God by virtue of the actual mutilation. It brought you closer to God because it really gets you to ask God to save you immediately. At the same time, this seems very much to be a parallel rationale because my guess is that chopping off someone's hands, feet, nose, and scalp is going to be an awfully good um, demonstrative act to get other people to stop doing crime. We know that people occasionally survived these mutilations, either for a couple of days or long enough for their family to take them home and, and try to get them healed somehow. So you have to really steal yourself to think about this idea of 
handless, noseless, footless individuals walking around, or whatever, um, because, <laughs> not to make light of that, um, but because they had violated earthly law. If you mess with the king, you will suffer badly. So you have these two threads uh, operating in tandem here, I think. Um, but hopefully, yeah, you could use that very nasty secular punishment to get you closer to God in the end. That was the ideal. The better off you are. <laughs> Fun time. Grading works the same way, by the way. <laughs> Last question. It's a good question. I think punishment of that sort was not meant to rehabilitate, rehabilitate in the way that we understand it today. There was not much expectation that you would walk away from a severe mutilation, go back to work, and become a functioning member of society because it was simply impossible. I think also these severe mutilations, even though they didn't kill you outright or weren't intended to kill you outright, my guess is that there was a very low survival rate in, in this period of time. Um, that said, I think the real rehabilitation that these authorities were aiming for was the soul. And if doing all of this very painful punishment to a criminal body was not enough to get them closer to God, to ask God for forgiveness and earn salvation, then that body was beyond help and that soul was beyond help as well. So it's... It's a tough question to answer because the rehabilitation is in the afterlife, not in the current life. D does that answer your question? You're welcome. So uh, before everybody rushes out, listen to these final two statements, please. Again, if you were here for extra credit because your professor told you to come, there are sign-up sheets over there. Sign in and I will give them to your professors. Um, two, uh, the faculty who are here and the graduate students who are here, if you are interested in joining us, we're going to have a reception down on the seventh floor and you can follow us down. Um, thank you for coming on this evening. Go have a happy night now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.